we really, really like sharing our knowledge of herbs with other people. So this evening we've been invited to talk about growing and using herbs just kind of generally and maybe getting a garden set up. Some of you maybe have one started and want to do more with it, or maybe you don't have anything at all and wish to get started. We have a fairly extensive um, group of herbs kind of all over our yard and we so what we're telling you this evening is you typically based on our experience um, after having taken care of herbs for quite a few years we have garnered uh, some ideas about how to raise and use herbs and so basically we're going to be sharing that kind of knowledge with you and we're, we'll be glad to answer as many questions as we can as we as we move on growing and using herbs We're also kind of new at this, so we're doing our best. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> now it's probably going to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> why should why should we put or use herbs in our lives? What's the point of having herbs? There are a great many uses for herbs. Um, we use them almost daily in our culinary, so in our cooking. You, you will find us putting uh, uh, herbs in just about everything that we cook daily. We also use them for different uh, medicinal health benefits uh, or just in some kind of our household or cosmetic things. We also encourage people to put them in their landscape. Herbs can um, be kind of serve a dual purpose. You can have a nice uh, southern wood bush over in the corner of your yard and it ha its ferny leaves uh, will uh, show off that corner of your yard but then you could also use those for other kinds of things so uh, we encourage people to think about the multiple uses that you can do with herbs and of course culinarily i guess that's a word it is now <laughs> it, it cuts down on salt and adds flavor uh, typically we get used to that salt flavor as americans we we consume somewhere up to four teaspoons of salt a day, and we just don't need that much. My husband has quite a few heart problems, and uh, so we start. We have been using herbs for lots of years, primarily to cut down on salt. Um, this last year, I was told I have high blood pressure, not because I use lots of salt, I don't think, but so uh, it's certainly as we get older, those conditions start to creep up on us. And so cutting down on salt is definitely one reason to add herbs to what we cook. Um, we often uh, use herbs. In fact, one of the things that we have made this spring is we made our own disinfectant. Instead of buying uh, disinfectants at the store, we made our own and we put herbs in them. Uh, herbs can be very freshening and cleaning, but they can also have disinfectant properties. So we, we have made our own disinfectants that we carry with us just about everywhere we go. Uh, you can also use them to keep insects uh, and bugs out of your house. Sprinkle some peppermint around the base of a, of a, a, a room and that helps to repel ants. Uh, we also, in landscaping, they may be a host to insects, but they also, we plant yarrow between our roses mm -hmm. and the yarrow acts as a deterrent to aphids. And so there are lots of things, that, ways to use herbs around, not only in your house, but around your yard. So one of the first things be, maybe as you start your herb garden or expand your herb garden is to think about what is it that you want to do with the herbs? Um, maybe you you really want to get some things going so you can make your own tea. And so what kinds of herbs would you grow to make a nice chamomile peppermint tea perhaps? And uh, or, or maybe you want to make your own green cleaning supplies. Uh, we know that you can go to the store and there's lemon verbena dish soap uh, <laughs> right there. And so how could you um, make something to do cleaning and then add some herbs to it to freshen and uh, your, when you're cleaning as well as disinfect and uh, clean around your house. 
So if anybody wants to type into the chat what it is that they might uh, be interested in using herbs for, that would be a cool way to, at least for us, to see what it is some people are interested in. That way then we can end up um, maybe emphasizing that as we go forward talking about some of the different herbs. So if anybody wants to, to be brave and type that in there, go for it now. We've got seasoning, cook and clean. Nice. Cooking, especially for salmon, please. Oh okay. oh, okay. Okay. Nice. Culinary. Awesome. Okay. Well, All hopefully right. as we go through, we will cover uh, many, many of those ideas. Cooking especially. We've, we've got a couple more coming in. They are soap, insect repellent, insects, mosquitoes, repellent, and beauty, and medicinal oh, tea. They're starting nice. to come in now. Alrighty. <laughs> awesome. Good. Glad to see all that interest. Yeah. Okay. I think it's just a little. It a seems little to be slow. a little slow. Maybe because we're here oh. in the backyard. Yeah, and I don't want to click too many times. <laughs> so if we jump ahead. Um, so one of the things to think about too, as mom was mentioning all of these different possible uses, the actual growing of the herbs can be as therapeutic as using them. Uh, that's one of the fav our favorite things about herbs actually is that they are typically very low maintenance, um, typically. <laughs> there are some occasions or depending you know, on a given year, but generally they're pretty low maintenance. Um, it's very relaxing when we're out harvesting or watering or doing any kind of maintenance a lot of times we um, have an ability to slow down and look at the myriad different uh, insects that are using all of the different herbs. So there's all different kinds and colors of spiders and different types of pollinators. We'll have all different kinds of birds, including hummingbirds that are there. Um, this evening I was out over this direction <laughs> um, in, in one of our side gardens and there was a really cute little finch and it was talking to me. Um, we've had some juncos this spring and some chickadees. So the robins, all different kinds of birds. So it, it really, it, and it doesn't have to be a large area. So even though I know behind us, it, it can look kind of expansive. That's why we wanted to put some pictures in here. And I have some friends in my gardening group online that everything is in pots. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be as small as a few, uh, like I have some ginger that's growing inside of my house. Um, so you can do them as house plants. Sometimes you can just have a nice little collection of pots that are there like on that patio. Um, I really liked the one that's kind of in the bottom center that has sort of these little almost like individual boxes. And so that's right up against somebody's house or right on the edge of a patio. So anywhere that you can squeeze them in, they're generally pretty flexible. Um, and you can, you would be surprised, I think, at what you can grow in a small space. One of the things I really like about herbs is that the majority of them, all of them actually, are aromatic. And so as you walk among your herbs, um, you're getting some good aromatherapy. Uh, the uh, uh, the lemon, our lemon verbena, we call them the lemon verbena sisters, are in great big pots, just as you see here. Uh, and that part of the reason for that is because they are a little tender, and so we bring them into the greenhouse in the winter. But they have a very wonderful citrusy smell, and so as you walk by them and rub a leaf, um, it's just very fragrant and relaxing to smell that. And um, because I do the majority of the drying of the culinary herbs, I get, a, I get flavors every day as I dry basil <laughs> and thyme and rosemary. And um, I just find that to be one of the best parts of growing herbs is all those aromas. And um, so, yeah, really fun to, uh, to, to grow them and have them around your yard. Usually I can tell when I come to visit her, because I don't live on the farm, um, when I come to the certified kitchen or to like our back room, that's kind of our office, like work room. Sorry, if there's an airplane, I don't know how loud it is for you, but it feels loud to me. <laughs> um, that I can tell, I'll be like, oh, are you working on catnip? Or, ooh, you're drying rosemary. So definitely that scent continues on, especially if you dry them. Um, and so you can have it all year round. 
give us just one second for it to move on. <laughs> Maybe is it being so it's just the internet. Let's see if we can get it here. Aaron, and we're going to start talking about this is that uh, herbs are fairly easy to maintain. As Erica, oh, we're going to talk about this first. Sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. We're getting things out of order. So we don't want to do that. Um, sort of going along with the, uh, that they're relatively easy to grow. Most herbs come from the Mediterranean region where it's pretty warm and generally in the summer it's relatively dry. Um, so herb, most of the herbs generally like to have quite a bit of sun. There are a few that can tolerate some partial shade and in the handout that Erica emailed out, I think to most of you, if you didn't get it beforehand, she will email it out afterwards. Um, and we'll, we have a little chart mm -hmm. at the end that's part of that handout um, that provides some of those, that information about some of the herbs that will tolerate partial shade. Then, so you, so you know that they're, they can, you can grow them even if you don't have full sun. One of the other things to know too, because they are from the Mediterranean, most of those, like if you think of Greece or that kind of area um, or Italy or France, oftentimes they have, um, many areas have very sandy, um, well-drained, loose soil, sometimes even rocky. So in our area, that is probably one of the biggest challenges is it rains a lot and we oftentimes have a much higher percent of clay. So sometimes actually being able to grow in a raised bed or a pot is actually to a significant advantage for some of the herbs because you can create your own soil inside that pot and make sure it drains really well. So if people have had problems with say rosemary, um, can't think of anything else. Rosemary is probably one of the most finicky ones mm -hmm. that's coming to mind. It's oftentimes because the rosemary roots are too wet and they really like to have um, dry feet is sometimes and dry roots. <laughs> um, so they don't like to ha be wet. And so if you can raise them up a little bit um, or like in this picture that's there in the lower left with the circle, you would cut out your lawn and then maybe amend that soil a little bit, add something that's a little bit drier. You can see some of the rocks that they've put in there to sort of decorative, but those could also be beneficial to the herbs as well. So that that would be probably the one caveat about the easy to grow. Um, even then, rosemary is probably about one of the more finicky herbs that we've had. Oh, thyme. Thyme yeah. is kind of finicky. <laughs> but even then, um, if you can put them, like our rosemaries mm -hmm. are facing southward. And so there, if you could put them up against a building, that will help collect a lot of heat and then could um, end up helping to dry out your soil. Some of our herbs grow in gravel, like in a gravel driveway type situation. So be willing to sort of be creative and think about where you might be able to sneak them in where you can get some of that more well-drained soil. There are a few that, uh, that you can think about, and we'll talk about a couple of those, that are almost like vegetables and, mm. and and are okay to grow in that type of a, a setting, uh, in, a, in a garden type setting where the soil is uh, very loose and amended and perhaps um, gets watered regularly. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, our herbs, uh, some of them, they, do, they, do, they rely on the rain that mm -hmm. we get. And, um, and, and so hopefully there'll be a little rain on Thursday because some of them are probably about ready for a drink and um, that's actually think about say. thinking about rosemary how it goes wild on the sides of the hills in Italy which is very rocky uh, keep that in mind I guess as you think about mm -hmm. things like thyme winter savory and rosemary and sage and sage all the woody kind of herbs so it's actually a really good segue as we're talking about water to go to maintenance um so you actually, I'll just skip ahead to that second uh, bullet to watering. Because they are adapted to those warm and drier climates, they do really well actually in our summers that we have here. Um, so some of our herbs right now, depending on their location, are actually not receiving any water at all. If you water them regularly, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend for something like rosemary or sage because they are woody and they don't do as well, some of the other herbs, if you water them more regularly, uh, like oregano or marjoram that we're gonna talk about, 
then you could get the herbs to grow, regrow more quickly after you're harvesting. So again, that's something to consider, but generally they won't need much water and you could target your watering to maybe just that, that bed or whatever. Um, but they're adapted to that warmer, drier climate. So it's not necessary. Also, you don't really need to fertilize them a whole lot. Um, th they grow really pretty well on their own and just following the natural seasons. We usually do um, in our potted herbs. So we do have some herbs that are potted, uh, like our lemon verbena sisters that mom was mentioning earlier. They're in big, huge, big, like tree-sized pots. And we bring them into our unheated greenhouse in the winter. And we do that because they will not survive outside um, in the winter months here in the Pacific Northwest. And so we will fertilize them because they're in that pot and, and their root system is limited. But even then, um, a lot of our herbs that are in the ground, we're not generally fertilizing them. If we do, we might give them some of our, our made compost or occasionally we'll buy like a natural organic based like fish fertilizer or something like that. Um, and it's when we remember to do it or when the plants maybe look like they need a little something, if they're looking a little yellow or where they're not growing quite as fast, but it's not something that we do regularly, like on a schedule or anything like that. So they're very low maintenance that way. Also a lot of, because a lot of the herbs um, are actually attracted to, or attract uh, beneficial insects, pest insect problems are generally pretty minimal. Um, and so any pest insects that might come because they're also attracting those beneficial insects, the beneficial insects will actually prey on or eat the pest insects. And so we generally don't have too many problems, maybe some rabbits. <laughs> We've had a few rabbit problems this spring um, where they really seem to like the marshmallow plant this year, even into June and July. Um, but other than that, I can't really think of the only thing I have noticed this year, and maybe some of you have noticed that too, uh, we did notice uh, earlier on a, 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 a black uh, aphid, mm -hmm. which, which is different than your typical green aphids. And they seem to be smaller. And I have noticed some very tiny holes on some of our basil. And I believe that's where that came, uh, where that has come from. And so, uh, but basil is kind of different from your typical Mediterranean uh, perennials. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but for the most part, we just don't have insects on our, on our herbs. And so that's nice. You don't have to spray uh, and things like that. The one thing we have learned about some of our plants, again, back to rosemary, is that <laughs> sometimes you have to put some mulch on it. Mm -hmm. Typically in December or January, we do get some cold days, sometimes mm -hmm. for a week or so, down into the 20s. And if you live up in the hills, <clears throat> either a brush prairie or a battleground, it will get fairly chilly up there. And so putting some mulch around the base of some of those plants will help them to uh, stay well through the winter. It also helps with weed control and keep moisture in uh, so that when as they get moisture in the spring, uh, then that will help them to keep that moisture as the summer begins to dry and they aren't as, they don't uh, get watered as much. And I was gonna say, I used to live in Yakult for anybody who might be familiar <laughs> with the greater Clark County area. And um, we used to have this very cold, bitter east wind that would come down off of the foothills. And we were at a significantly higher elevation than here at the farm in Brush Prairie. And I did lose a rosemary and a catnip. Um, so if I had continued to live at that house, one of the things that I probably would have done would have been to put the rosemary on the other side of the house where the house would protect it from that east wind. So I would have put it on the west side instead um, or somewhere on a corner. So those are some things to think about when you're planning your garden. Do you, do you have it a place that's particularly windy? that probably wouldn't be a good place to put rosemary, for example. Um, rosemary is funny. I was talking earlier about making sure that the roots don't get too wet, but then it doesn't like to get dried out. It seems to have a hard time recovering from that. So, you know, go figure. Rosemary can be kind of finicky, but in the winter time then, like that when mom's talking about it getting down to 20 degrees or even uh, lower, 
Rosemary struggles with those, um, even sort of 34, uh, sometimes below 40 degrees, or it gets near freezing. Rosemary can, you can still sometimes lose your rosemary. So if you can put it in a place where it can maintain good sun, maybe up against a building or near a building where it's a little more protected, um, I feel bad like we're emphasizing rosemary, but it's just the one that's sometimes the most finicky, but I would think the same for thyme. Sage is a little more hardy, um, and so is winter savory for some of those woody perennials that are like that, where they're going to maintain some of their leaves throughout the winter, so that just makes them a little more exposed. Often people will ask us, I, my, the place where I'm going to put my herbs, it's, it only gets um, sun for five, six hours a day. It's like on one side of my house or it's, and so when the sun goes down on one side or the other, it won't, it won't be sunny. And that's perfectly fine. We, uh, we have a couple of herb beds like that. They are not in sun all day long and that's perfectly fine. They will be in the shade for part of the day and, and that works, that would, that will work just fine as you start to look for a site for your various herbs. So some really quick gardening tips before we dive into the individual herbs. Um, know your herbs. So when we were talking earlier about what is it that you want to do with herbs, uh, one of the herbs that came up was peppermint, for example. And you can use that in tea, uh, mint jelly, or cooking, um, or for... Um, Ant deterrent. Ant deterrent. That's what I, said. I knew. That. I was like, household cleaning. That was the other thing. So definitely a multi-purpose herb. Um, if anybody's into alcoholic beverages, mint juleps, or things like that. So it doesn't, it has a lot of uh, purposes. So it would be a really good herb to start with. However, it can be a pretty aggressive spreader. Uh, lemon balm is another one that spreads by both seeds and runners that's in the mint family. So you might want to consider um, something that's, you know, maybe these whiskey barrels, like what we've put here in the picture, um, and consider that. To, to keep an eye on it and make sure if you're if you have a small space or you're concerned about things spreading. Um, know your herb, know if it's an annual versus a perennial, which we'll dive into a little bit when we get to some of these individual herbs. Uh, basil, cilantro, dill, those are all annuals and so those are ones that we grow in our vegetable garden with our vegetables and so we treat them almost like a vegetable. Whereas some of our other herbs like the ones that are pictured there in those whiskey barrels, there's some thyme, some chives, some different sages, those are all perennials. And so where you put them, you you probably want to kind of leave them, whereas the annuals, you could move them around if you needed to. Sometimes I think of annuals as seeds. Uh, annuals have to be planted every year. And so often they will grow from seeds. Uh, just as Erin said, basil, dill, cilantro, those are seeds. It is not cut and dry, but that's one way to kind of keep things in mind is that annuals often have, they have to be planted every year and they typically grow from seeds. Whereas perennials, uh, once you buy a plant and typically that's how you get uh, perennials started is to buy a plant start and put it wherever you want it. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't move it later or divide it into parts, but often where you put it is where you should want it. And be sure to leave room to grow for those perennials. Um, and be prepared, I guess, too, to do some harvesting. And then you can shape your um, some of your woodier perennials, like the rosemary, thyme, uh, sage, things like that. And then it seems really simple, but label your herbs. Uh, we've been working with herbs for a long time. <laughs> More than 20 years, <laughs> we'll just say. We'll do the easy math. And so at this point, we know where our herbs are and, and what they look like. Um, I can't say that I'm always good enough to be able to identify them if I smell them like a dried herb. Um, but looking at the plant, most of the time we can figure out what it is. If you're new to it, um, you don't have to get anything quite so fancy or cute as I, I put here. Um, we have successfully used cheap popsicles from the popsicle sticks from the dollar store and a Sharpie marker <laughs> to start with. Um, so use what you have available. We also, every spring when we're starting our seeds, we actually cut up plastic milk jugs or water gallon uh, water jugs and we just write on a Sharpie and that lasts 
maybe not all of the season, especially in direct sun, but it, it will at least get you started if you just need a way to get going initially um, until you become more familiar with that herb. And knowing what your herbs are will really come in handy later as you start to harvest them. And, and they don't look quite the same once they, they're kind of dry <laughs> as they did as they were in the ground. So having that label and keeping it with your herb as you go uh, through uh, planting, harvesting, and using will um, make a difference. They all start to look the same. That's <laughs> green leaves on a dried stem. So, <laughs> um, okay, let's see. We're at about the halfway point. Ah, and it was exactly what I thought it was. So really quick, Erica, do we want to take a quick second and see if there are any questions sort of about setting up gardens, maintenance, things like that before we move on to the individual herbs? Yeah, so um, there's a few good questions here. And one is, um, is lavender an herb? And that sort of begs the question of what is an herb? Yeah, oh, that's a really great question. Um, so maybe we'll start with sort of the second part on what is an herb. So we consider things to be an herb um, when you're using the flowers or the leaves. So anything that's sort of um, more of the green, softer part of, of the plant. Things that we consider to be a spice, for example, would be cinnamon, you're using the bark. Cloves, you're using the seeds. Um, cilantro is actually a really good example that I think we're gonna come to after chives maybe, um, that where with cilantro, most people use the, the leaves either fresh or dried, and then the seed itself, if you were to let it go to flower and seed, that's coriander and that's a spice. So you can have the same plant produce both an herb and a spice. And so going back to lavender, I consider lavender to be an herb because you're pulling off the flowers and using that uh, for many different uses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think too, uh, one difference between herbs and spices is that spices typically are tropical. Uh, mm. we, uh, we, one spice, I guess, that we did try to grow was cumin, and it just is not hot enough here. I know that some of you maybe even have a bay tree, uh, mm. which is kind of a spice, uh, but a uh, spice herb, I guess. It's very <laughs> tropical, and, and we, we, ha we did try to grow a bay tree, and we were not successful, so... I guess that's kind of the difference between herbs and spices. I think we could be successful growing a bay tree. <laughs> we just, w one little caveat I guess to know about us and how we grow is that um, obviously we're emphasizing the maintenance a few slides ago. We're um, frugal with our time a little bit. Uh, and so we, the things that require too much effort or too much work, we're not those kind of garden ladies. Uh, the Lemon Verbena sisters are very special, and I would say they're probably the rare exception mm -hmm. for almost all of the herbs that we grow, that they actually get brought into the greenhouse, and they have special pots that have been purchased for them, and it's a, a big to-do, at least for the two of us, that it's like, is it time to bring them out, and is it too early, and but when it, do we put them back in, and so they're the only ones, though. Right. Yeah. yeah, the only ones. They're in between the time they're in the greenhouse and they are outside, they are easy to take care of. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess we're easy growers. So, you have to decide too how much time you have and want to put into your garden. And so, sometimes that might help you decide what you want to grow. For sure. And it's not because we're lazy, it has nothing to do with, <laughs> to do with that. We just, we just to, to keep, choose to keep low maintenance plants. Because we're busy doing things with them, I think, right. too. So, right. yeah. Erica, are there, any, yeah, are there any herbs that you can grow indoors on a windowsill? Ah, uh, that's a great question and a tricky one. Um, there are. I think one of the things in the research that we've done mm -hmm. and our little bit of uh, effort that we put into that, which, again, that was a perfect, actually, segue right. because talking about minimalist time, um, Yes, you can, but typically because, especially in the Pacific Northwest, <clears throat> excuse me, it does get kind of gray and the sun angle is quite low in the winter. You, if you expect to grow herbs and harvest them during the winter, you need to have supplemental light. It just is, we have not found it to be feasible to grow herbs and actually be able to harvest them without some kind of grow lights uh, and perhaps even some additional heat, depending on which direction your window is facing. And several of the uh, 
annuals are uh, basil and dill and cilantro. They will they will grow inside. Those mm -hmm. are pretty good. Chives do pretty well. I know when you go uh, or even as you look online, you will see things like rosemary and thyme, and they put those in a pot and suggest you grow them inside. I, you, again, you decide what you want, to, how mm -hmm. you choose to uh, help them grow. We find them to be big plants and uh, didn't feel like they would grow well <clears throat> inside in a pot. But uh, And actually thinking of rosemary, that was where I was mentioning about it getting dried out, that oftentimes when we heat our homes in the winter, we have like hot air blowing through the house. And so sometimes for rosemary, that's when she gets finicky and it's you'd think, oh, it, it's cold outside, it, it, the plant should actually be happy inside. And that dry air really dries the herb out and pulls all of the water out of those leaves. Um, and so even though you may be watering at the base, it's drying out the plant itself. And so it's having to put some extra effort and energy into trying to maintain its appropriate water levels inside the plant. And then it can't put energy into growing, especially if you're harvesting it. So, And that reminds me, thinking of <laughs> having something in a pot, even if you grow herbs in a pot all the time outside in big pots mm -hmm. on your patio or whatever, they will require a little more watering than, than they would if they were in the ground. So if, uh, because pots dry out, mm -hmm. and those of you who are just general gardeners probably know that, and so you just have to keep an eye on things. If you're growing basil, it probably has to be watered every day. If you have a rosemary in a pot, you might not have to water it more than once a, a week or once every two weeks. But so you just, uh, but when you grow things in pots, they do take a little more watering. And just a little more uh, observation is yes. the word. like paying, right. a, paying attention. So, right. um, okay. Anything so I have, else? Yeah, there's two more that I think will fit here and we'll just lump Great. these together. Will herbs grow in a straw bale garden? And are there any herbs that would be a good alternative to a lawn? Ah, okay. Ooh. So maybe we'll do the lawn one first because I think that's a little easier and we actually <laughs> have experience with that. Uh, yarrow, Roman chamomile. I feel like I'm forgetting something else. Uh, penny royal. Oh, penny royal. And then there's like an elfin or the creeping time. The creeping time. Yeah. The creeping time doesn't mow as well. So if you're anticipating mowing your lawn, make sure that your the deck on your mower goes pretty high. Um, penny royal, I'd say if you had like a, a spectrum, time is over here for how it doesn't want to be mowed very little, if at all. Penny Royal is probably about here, and yarrow and Roman chamomile are over here that they don't mind being mowed, yarrow in particular. And I'm saying that because we have yarrow in our yard. <laughs> it has escaped and, and lives in the yard. We do have some oregano and or marjoram that has also escaped into the driveway, um, and that gets mowed pretty regularly. So I think if you did maybe one of the golden marjorams or the golden oreganos that are a little bit smaller or something that's creeping, I think you could probably get away with one of those. We just don't have experience with it, but yarrow, Roman chamomile, um, penny royal, and then the creeping time if you are okay not mowing as often. And are any of those deer resistant? That I don't know. We don't have, um, we don't have deer problems here, <laughs> so that's not something I have personal experience with. I think the time probably would be yarrow isn't super tasty, but I have seen deer graze it in in natural habitats because yarrow is a native plant and you can find it all over the place. Um, and I think they will eat it if they if it's they're blooming hungry. and they're hungry and it's tasty yeah. early in the spring, maybe. So I, I would make no guarantees. And often you will read somewhere that, oh, this and that is deer resistant and and uh, deer. <laughs> Deer are strange creatures, and again, if they're hungry, they will eat it. So, and it's I, hard to know from season to season, season like right. what's available for them to eat out in the wild and what they may or may not right. eat. Although I know people with roses, you know, that's a common problem. <laughs> Something about roses that are tasty. Okay, and then the straw bale gardens. I don't see why any herb yeah. wouldn't grow um, because depending on. Oh, let's see, because you're talking about growing in the straw bale itself. Is that correct in my understanding? Or is it making the frame of the straw bale and then having soil in the middle? Can the, stra or the question straw didn't, didn't go into too much depth. I, I think okay. it's the, the typical straw bale type of garden, and I'm not sure which 
which they yeah, do. And I, I've never done those. So I'm not familiar with them. I would say if you were going to do that, I would keep away from the more woody herbs. So I would, I would stay away from thyme, rosemary. I would try sage. Sage is pretty easy to find and generally inexpensive, or you can get a plant from a friend or something. And so that would be the one that I might experiment with. Uh, and maybe winter savory, but say if you wanted to experiment with a woodier herb, sage would be the one that I would start with just because it's generally pretty hearty um, and it's my favorite herb, so I'm biased. <laughs> um, and then I don't see why you couldn't do any annuals. If you're gonna grow veggies there, you could do basil, cilantro, dill. I feel like I'm forgetting another one. Summer either. savory. Summer savory. So you could try any mm -hmm. of those ones that are annuals. I would just mix them in with your vegetables. And and I, if you wanted to do something um, that would be like a attractant for beneficial insects or a deterrent for, um, but yeah, beneficial insects or a deterrent for pest insects, you could try some yarrow. It's pretty flexible, easy grower. I would, oregano, marjoram. I, I don't see why you couldn't try some of those and see what happens. I think they'd be successful. Okay, so ready to move on to chives? Thinking about the straw bales, I was thinking chives would probably <laughs> grow well in um, straw bales. Chives are, a, a, I guess, an alternative to onions in the sense that mm. that's their flavor. It's a mild onion leaf flavor, so it makes it real versatile. It's a perennial, so that means it comes back every year. It uh, gets to be maybe a foot tall. It, um, and partial shade is okay. Ch chives are real hardy. I, mm -hmm. I find them to be uh, able to grow almost almost anywhere. Uh, they don't. They um, this time of year they start to uh, lose their uh, prettiness. They uh, we have found that no matter what we do, that chives often start to get little rust spots this time of year. Mm -hmm. That's just that's how they grow. Chives are an early spring. Uh, herb and mm -hmm. so uh, they're best used then. They, the flowers, uh, you can see there in the, on the slide that they're a pretty lavender flower. It looks kind of like a, a little bit like a dandelion. They make a very nice vinegar, a chive vinegar, which has just a little, little bit of a lavender uh, shade and it's very tasty in uh, all kinds, salad dressings, but all kinds of uh, marinades and so forth. Uh, for the uh, uh, chives are also, uh, if you make an infusion, that means you make like a tea out of the, out of the whole chive, as especially the flowers too. It helps to get rid of mildew off of roses, so it's a household in that regard. Do we know of any cosmetic uses for chives. <laughs> I'm not sure I would want onion flavor on my face or anything. So no, we don't know that. It does have mild antiseptic properties, but for health and um, in health benefits, it doesn't have a lot of use either, but it is a wonderful onion flavor. Uh, makes uh, just, it's, it's just really, uh, again, very versatile. Uh, yeah. If you, if you don't want to grow onions, because onions are make you cry, then chives are the way to go. <laughs> chives are your gateway to onions. So if you don't like onions, I used to not, um, and now I chop them and use them in everything, I would use chives all the time. So I do have a little flower here, and this one's a little faded, it's not as bright, and that's partly because it is later in the season. Um, and so what we will oftentimes do is as early as maybe mid-March, mid Mm -hmm. So one of the things to know about them too is they are perennial, but they will die back to the ground. And so if you haven't grown them before, you'll think, oh my gosh, they're dead. And they are, but the bulbs are still there underneath the ground. So uh, just like an onion, they have a little tiny bulb and then they'll come up in the very early spring. And they're so delicious in that March. They're one of the very first herbs. That's oftentimes the herb that we start harvesting and drying first. Um, and so you can take the flower and you can actually pluck off probably can't see it very well. Um, pluck off just one of these little tiny buds and then that's what you can put into a salad. So uh, I'm a big texture person and I don't like to have big chunks of things. So uh, if you want to use these flowers in your salad, um, they have, they're attached here at the base and you just cut that base off and then it releases all the little flowers and then you can sprinkle them in your salad. And because they have 
in the spring in particular, they have this very vibrant, bright purple color. They will actually infuse a white or light colored vinegar and turn them like a pinkish, mm -hmm. very electric pink color. And it doesn't take very long. I wouldn't do it for more than a day max um, if you don't want too strong of an onion flavor. The longer you leave those flowers in there, the more strong the onion flavor will get. Um, but it it's very, you can use it in all different kinds of culinary uses, so. This is one of the, herbs that you can't, that does start from seeds uh, fairly well. It also though, what grows well from a plant start. And if mm -hmm. you know someone who has chives, I'm sure they are more than willing Very to divide easy. up some of their chives because chives are a somewhat of a spreader. Can be. And, and uh, so if you keep them in their spot, they're okay, but uh, otherwise uh, they will spread. And so just a little bit. Little they're bit. not super aggressive. No, they're not like mince And that's why using these flowers in your salads or to make vinegars and harvesting them actually will help you because there's, I don't know, 50 little flowers within this whole seeds. compound flower head. And then each of them are producing <laughs> multiple seeds. And those, so you can imagine pretty quickly, you'll get a lot of seeds. And so if you harvest them, then, um, then you'll be at least preventing that one part of it. So so here's cilantro um, and or coriander, like we were talking about before. We mentioned it was an annual. Um, it can get a little bit taller, particularly when it goes to flower. Um, we're used to doing this live in person, and so we usually have herbs and we pass them around. So um, this is, I, I wish I had smell-o-vision so you could smell it. So this is what the flower looks like, and eventually it will make round pods and that will become the coriander. That's not usually the part that people use. And this is a good little segue to talk about making sure that you harvest regularly so that your herbs don't go to flower, especially like with cilantro, because it will bolt and then your leaves won't be quite as flavorful. So most of the time people are taking this part instead. It looks, it looks a lot like parsley, mm -hmm. um, grows like parsley. Spicier. <laughs> and you can plant it in the uh, spring fairly early like parsley or again in the late fall. Uh, well, early fall, excuse me, like like parsley. Mm -hmm. And we actually plant ours so that it's in shade. And so that seems to help keep it from bolting quite as quickly. And it seems to actually enjoy it. We plant it in uh, mid-May at the earliest. So it's actually one of the earlier annual herbs that we'll plant directly into the garden. Um, some of you might be going, oh, cilantro, because about 20% of people think it tastes like soap. So mm -hmm. there is a a DNA difference between people who like cilantro and people who don't. Um, sometimes you can find the seeds, especially in um, the Mediterranean region or the Middle East where they've ground the seeds and use it in incense and potpourri. Like chives, I don't really want to smell like cilantro, so there's not really any known cosmetic uses. Many of the herbs that you can find in your uh, spice cupboard they are all, all known for digestion. That's why traditionally and historically humans have used it in their food. So um, that's really common of a lot of the different herbs that we'll talk about tonight for culinary uses. Um, and so in some areas, they will use the tea to aid digestion. If you want, if you do want coriander, then Erin showed you this little seed pods that are starting to form on some of our plants that have uh, gone to flower, then you, that's what you would do. You would let it go. And then when it does form the seed pods and they turn brown, you have to wait for them to turn brown. You can harvest those seeds and then you would have coriander. And cilantro and coriander are both very common. They have a pep it has a, a fairly flavorful peppery freight flavor that's common in Latin American and East and, and Asian dishes. So uh, it, it can be, um, it can, it can bite your tongue a little bit. <laughs> and it is a self-seeding annual. So even if you, Yes. harvest it if you let it go to seed you will probably end up with some little baby plants coming up on their own the following may um, and we have also successfully saved seed from cilantro and replanted our own seed as well that's true if you don't choose to cook with it okay we are gonna book it along just a little bit um and we're combining oregano and marjoram together even though they are two different species they're perennials they'll grow anywhere from about 12 inches to two feet uh, they do, there are, both of these herbs are right next to each other, and then our chives are right next to it. So they get pretty regular water from the garden um, as well, because they're right next to our veggie garden. They do fine in partial shade as well. 
really common in Italian, Spanish, and Mexican cooking. And oftentimes when we're cooking with them, we think of them as like the base. So that's the one that we use the most of. And then something like winter savory or rosemary or thyme that has much stronger flavors, we don't use as much of that. Um, sometimes you'll find them, particularly the flowers that are pictured there from marjoram, they're really beautiful. They dry really nicely and they look really great in bouquets. So you can actually use them that way. Um, sometimes you can find the tincture, which is with alcohol or um, witch hazel as like a body splash. And then Historically, uh, both marjoram and oregano were used as a hair rinse or sometimes in, in hair conditioners so they can soften your hair. Um, oregano and marjoram, again, really common for stomach ailments. And then uh, sometimes you'll find marjoram or oregano, like I don't know if anybody's familiar with oregano oil. My dad uses that for sinus and congestion. And then I actually put marjoram in my tea blend for colds and things like that. And so people will say, well, what's the difference? <laughs> and the difference is, it, it, there is a taste difference. Oregano mm -hmm. tends to be a little more peppery and spicy, mm -hmm. and marjoram is a very mild, uh, a very mild herb. And um, but if you, as you harvest them, they will grow back. And so uh, you want to harvest them fairly regularly, and then you'll have lots of oregano and marjoram throughout the summer. They also dry well, mm -hmm. and so if you want some for the winter cut some off and, and dry it to save. So we've already talked about rosemary quite a bit. Um, she is a woody perennial, can get as tall as four feet. I think I'm thinking about that because I think that's about how tall a couple of our plants are. They can get quite wide as well, almost the same width as they are tall. So keep that in mind um, if you're not going to harvest a lot and regularly. They really do prefer drier soil, like we mentioned. They will do okay with light shade, but they really prefer um, full sun. And just a reminder that we talked about protecting them a little bit from cold with mulch and then thinking about those cold winter winds. They have a very strong flavor, so they a little bit of rosemary goes a long way. We use it a lot with meat and potatoes, so very traditional farmer type fare. Um, do the nice roasted potatoes with some olive oil and uh, rosemary, very common. It's really great vinegar, actually. Mm -hmm. And bees really, really, really love the rosemary flowers, which we put a picture there of. And sometimes it will flower almost early, before early. it's very early, like when the chives are going. And so it's a really good nectar source um, for a lot of different pollinators, not just honeybees early in the season. We oftentimes use it as a insect repellent. So we make little, we dry it and use it with some other herbs in sachets, like in our pet beds. You'll find it in potpourri. It's been a very common historical, uh, both a mouthwash and a hair rinse. So infusing into vinegar, not just to eat it, but to rinse in your hair. Um, and then sometimes you'll find ground up rosemary in soaps, like gardener soaps for exfoliation. And then it's, you'll find it sometimes in liniments and um, like salves because of that sort of strong astringent type smell that you'll get. It, it can help deal with like bruising or sore muscles or things like that. Anything to add about rosemary? Nope. Okay, moving on. <laughs> sage, which is one of my very favorites. We have three different kinds pictured here. Traditional garden sage, Big Leaf, which is my favorite, or Burgarten is sometimes the name that you'll find, and then Purple Sage. I find them all to taste the same. There are also tricolor and bicolor and pineapple and all different kinds, um, but these three that are pictured here are all basically uh, Salvia officinalis. Not unlike rosemary, it's a woody bush, uh, well-drained soil, full sun, although it's not quite as picky as rosemary is. Again, it's going to have a really rich flavor, very common with turkey dinners. <laughs> um, when you, it dries really nicely as well, uh, and really beautiful, like silvery color. So, you know, you could just dry, grab a little bunch like this and dry it, and it makes really nice wreaths. Um, some of the fresh leaves may deter ants. Again, not unlike rosemary, really common a vinegar rinse for uh, dry scalp and dark colored hair. Um, and then because it is so astringent, it can be really good for like tightening pores on your skin. And then my very favorite way to use it, if you smell it, again, I wish I had smell-o-vision um, to share with you. It's 
it's got this almost like smoky flavor. And so I really, really like it for sinus problems and like that drainage. And then it does have a little bit of a um, numbing effect. And so if you have like a sore throat or that drainage, it can help soothe that a little bit. And then it makes a really great mouthwash with rosemary and thyme. Okay, savory. There are two kinds of savory. There is uh, summer savory, which uh, is grown from seed. Uh, it's an annual. Uh, it tends to grow kind of tall and sprawling, and so sometimes you want to plant it fairly close together. It may have to be propped up, and it uh, gets it, it gets to, it can be uh, 12 to 18 inches tall. Uh, there is also winter savory, which is a perennial. It's a shrubby bush, just like sa uh, thyme and uh, and sage. It probably is more the size of a sage plant as opposed to a thyme plant or rosemary. So it's a kind of medium-sized uh, plant. We we grow quite a bit of uh, winter savory, mainly because it's it's easy to grow. And we don't have to <laughs> we don't have to put it in our garden and. Um, and it dries, it dries uh, easily and maintains its flavor when it dries. And so because we are using it in culinary uh, herb blends, uh, we like to have, we like to have something that maintains that flavor a lot. It, uh, it just like um, the other woody plants, it goes well in stews and meats and soups. Uh, it has, it has a very uh, nice flavor. Uh, maybe not quite as strong as rosemary, but more than say thyme. And so it's, again, you, a little bit goes a long way. It, savory uh, can be used as a mouthwash along with uh, just like uh, some of our other ones, make a tea or an infusion out of it. Um, the flowers, uh, it does have a nice little white flower on it. And mm -hmm. so uh, that helps to uh, oily skin. And the pollinators really like the flowers on the ro or savory as well. And it comes out a little bit later after say rosemary or even sage. And so the timing, it sort of lines up for good pollinators. And if you have time for a, a nice bath, uh, savory and lavender and rosemary can be mm -hmm. very stimulating. You've worked in your garden all day and <laughs> say, oh gosh, I do have time for a bath. You could make a nice uh, sachet of rosemary, lavender and savory. Uh, tea, as so many herbs, as Erin said, that typically uh, it's good for digestion. Uh, you can make a poultice out of it for bad joints. <laughs> so really quick, I just want to acknowledge that our time says 756. We have two herbs left. We're doing tarragon and thyme. So just, just to let people know that we are we are aware of time if you are aware of time as well and you need to go we're we're doing our best to move along so tarragon um i don't know why i'm talking about this one this is not this is my probably least favorite herb but i'll go ahead and talk about because it because it it's my favorite it's her favorite herb it is the only edible artemisia that is uh i mean i guess people drink wormwood which is also an artemisia but this is I know I mean, both of us are like, huh? Um, it does have a very strong flavor and it does have kind of like an anise or licorice type flavor. So it's kind of an acquired taste. There are two different varieties, French and Russian. Um, some people think the French tastes better. We find it to be a little bit less of a sturdy or hearty uh, plant. And so we oftentimes grow the Russian because it just does, it seems to handle the winter a little bit better. This says that it grows one to two feet, and I would say our Russian is probably taller than that right now. Like we've let Maybe. it go ahead and go to flower because we're going to go ahead and, and cut it off and dry it. So you can actually use, um, use it dried in different collections that way, and it's cool in bouquets. It, tarragon is very common as a vinegar, um, very common with fish and chicken particularly in French dishes, and then anything with eggs or, or cold salads, cold summer salads. So one thing to know about tarragon um, is that if, and see if you were here, we would pass it around and everybody could try this, uh, where you, and you could try this to like take a leaf and put it on your tongue and just sort of let it sit there and your tongue will tingle and maybe get a little bit numb. And so oftentimes historically they would use this to sort of hide 
the flavor of bad medicine and then numb the person's sort of, um, what am I thinking of, on your tongue, the taste buds so that you couldn't taste the bad medicine. So part of the reason we included this one is because it's a little bit different. It is also becoming quite popular. <clears throat> and so um, the others are fairly common, uh, herbs, thyme, rosemary, savory, ba um, uh, and but we wanted to also share uh, something that's a little different and tarragon is perhaps one of those. And again, the Russian variety is super easy to grow. So if you're looking for something- They are both perennial, so- Yeah, yeah. Start we just start find that the French doesn't stick around as much or grow, grow as robust. The Russian grows very robust. So if you find that you like tarragon, uh, the Russian variety is for you and you can harvest to your heart's content. <laughs> it's not a big spreader though. No. Um, okay, and our very last one is thyme. Lots of different varieties. It's a very compact bush. Uh, I would say even 12 inches is probably a little, I don't even know the ours always grow yeah. that tall, but we're harvesting a lot. Um, all different kinds of vegetables, fish. Uh, I like to use it a lot with savory actually, and a little bit of rosemary and then some oregano. And I use that like in my soups and stews in the winter. It, it's, in, it's in almost all recipes for yeah, very uh, common. Casseroles and, and uh, things like that. Uh, it's, it's often the, la the smallest portion, but uh, thyme just seems to be that, uh, that little bit of a, a herb that really makes a, a recipe pop. You'll oftentimes find it in household cleaning products. So uh, there's a soap blend that I think my mom likes that's like a lemon thyme um, and so sometimes you'll find it that way because it also is known to be really antibacterial and antiviral so sometimes you'll find it in cleaning products that way. We've used it combined with baking soda like the dried powdered herb as like an oven cleaner. Um, you'll find oil of thyme a lot in a lot of different like commercial cosmetic products. I combine it a lot with sage for colds and sore throats. Um, and then sometimes you'll find an oil infusion and it can be used for like aches and pains. So, so this is the um, table that sort of takes all of the information that we just went through, I know somewhat quickly, and puts it into a nice, very easy to see table. So you'll see the herb on the left, the life cycle is P is perennial, A is annual. There's the average height that it gets, some of its growing needs, and then the uses are over there on the right-hand side. C is culinary, M is medicinal, CO is cosmetic. Oh, T is for tea, like the drinking kind. Um, and H is for household. And then M is for, maybe I said that M is for medicinal. So this will show up either in the recording um, or you can find it in the handout that you've either already received or that you'll get when Erica emails you uh, the survey which please complete that, um, give a plug for Erica there for her post-event survey. Um, and so you'll be able to get that that way. So that's what we had. Were there any uh, questions? I know we've gone a little bit over time. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. There's a few questions. One is, uh, can you eat oregano flowers? I don't see why you couldn't. Um, the texture person in me is going a little like, huh, um, but I don't see why not. Don't let my texture issues prevent you from being experimental and doing that. So yeah, I, you could put them in a salad just like you could um, with chai flowers. So often when I harvest and dry herbs, I, I typically avoid harvesting uh, the fla flowers of m most plants because I want the green leaves. So it, it's, it's just a matter of what you want to do. Uh, when you take herbs and use them fresh in your cooking, often you're cutting up the leaves. Undoubtedly, you could cut up the flowers and use them too. I don't think that most, many, uh, many herb flowers are not as, flav not mm -hmm. as flavorful as the leaves. Okay, there's two questions about drying the herbs. One is, um, how do you dry them? And then one, <laughs> one Sorry, is, um, um, oh, I've lost it. It's um, what temperature is your? Okay, well let's let, we'll do a quick. We'll do a quick. Yeah, and then maybe you can go back to the yeah. second one. Um, oh, drying herbs is a whole 
class in and of itself because there are a lot of different ways. Um, One of the easiest ways for new, newbies or beginner people is to uh, grab a, a cut, uh, cut off a bunch, turn it upside down and put it in a paper bag. And we put our paper bags in our greenhouse, but you could certainly hang the paper bags in a uh, in your kitchen or whatever. Mm -hmm. The reason we put them in paper bags is to keep dust and bugs off of them. But that's one of the easiest way. If you go down to the fort, you will see herbs just hanging in the kitchen over the smoky mm -hmm. fire, <laughs> which is how our pioneer mothers did. But uh, we encourage you to put them in paper bags. So that's one of the easiest way. We also dry herbs in the sun. Uh, things like catnip and pennyroyal, things that we're going to use for um, non-culinary use. Mm -hmm. We also use a dehydrator and it, you just sit, you need to either look that up on the website or or check your um, check the book, the instruction mm -hmm. book that comes with your dehydrator. We have a, 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 a nice Excalibur, which <laughs> we did, we have not always had, but we use that for drying herbs. We also dry herbs in the microwave. We discourage people from drying them in the oven. The oven gets too, too hot. hot. And um, who wants to keep their oven door open in the hot summer? Yeah. So there are great many ways to dry herbs, and uh, but the easiest way is to just dry them in a paper bag. Yeah, and you can put them in a paper bag and even put them in a sunny window, and then you just need to check them pretty regularly. So mom mentioned that we're putting like catnip and pennyroyal in our greenhouse on screens. And sometimes in really hot times, like last week, they were dry in a day. And so we go and we grab them pretty quickly because, and that's the other reason why paper bags can be useful is because they help block the direct sunlight onto the herb. Um, so you can get the heat from the sun, but then you don't get the UV rays breaking your, your leaves down. So you do have to be a little bit careful with that. So paper bags can be useful that way too. But yeah, harvesting and drying herbs, preserving herbs is a whole, <laughs> a whole separate class. <laughs> but maybe that'll help people get started. Yeah. Um, is it better to use plastic or terracotta pots? Oh, I find that terracotta pots dry out a lot faster. So while we're not big fans of plastic in general in life, um, I find that they hold the water quite mm -hmm. a bit better. And so thinking again about the frugality of our time <laughs> um, and reducing our maintenance time, we, we do use plastic pots. Uh, we do have some that are in terracotta, but they're getting watered regularly be because they're in a garden space that's getting watered regularly, um, but the ones that aren't there in plastic pots. So, and they're, I don't know, they last longer. Yeah, the terracotta seems to break down uh, in the winter, yeah, just like many things do from the uh, freezing and uh, unthawing. There's okay. a question about slugs. Are they much of a problem? And this person thinks they had mm. slug damage to dill this. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Slugs were a bit spring because of the cold, wet spring. Um, the herbs that we have the most problem with slug damage are like anise hyssop and then sometimes my marshmallow, but I have enough marshmallow that it's not a problem. Um, so we do use sluggo, which is uh, organic certified um, pellets that we get. And so we will sprinkle some of that out early in the year. Generally in the vegetable garden, which is where we're growing our dill, we do not have a big problem yeah. with slugs. They have gotten to our oregano and marjoram in the past. And so sometimes what will happen is you'll have the stem like, like this and they'll eat three quarters of the way through the stem and then it will just like fall over like this and then it'll be all wilty. But even then our patch of marjoram and oregano is big enough that we just go, ah, darn slugs and we move on. So people who have things in pots or smaller beds, you might have to resort to some sluggo as much as we don't like to do that. We, we do do that occasionally, um, but like that, we use something that's pet safe and because we've had some problems in the past. So we use pet safe and we use something that's OMRI certified or it's certified for organic, certified organic farms to use. Well, that's all the questions I'm seeing now. Thank you both, Great. that was really wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and I want to thank everyone who attended this evening and remind you to watch your email for my message. 
including um, the link to the survey and also where you can find a recording of tonight's talk. Oh, and one we'll continue. Oh, go ahead. Plug. <laughs> I, I can't help it. Garden Delights Herb Farm. We do have a website and we yeah. always enjoy uh, people checking checking us out on our Facebook and our website. And thank you very much. Yeah, and we have a newsletter that we send out. So a lot of times, uh, like the stuff that we've talked about tonight, we send out little articles. We have a little blog. And so once a month, we'll send out a newsletter and you can sign up for that on our website. So and if again, we, again, now that Erica kindly helped us figure all of this out, then uh, we might continue doing this through the farm. Um, and then we are giving a class later this month too with naturescaping. So Erica, will master gardeners be able to get credit for that? They so will. The yes, they will. <laughs> okay. So if you want to come and join us, we're talking about herbal distillation with naturescaping on August 14th. August 14th. So you could, if you're master gardeners, you could get your credit that way too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Good Thank evening. You, everyone. Take care. <laughs>